Hi, I'm Simon Hartley. And I'm Helen Van Martin. Welcome back to Pep Talks. Helen, we're joined today by a very good friend of mine, Brendan Hall. Brendan's a clip around the world yacht skipper, a victorious clip around the world yacht skipper. And actually, when I was thinking back on uh, the stories that Brendan's told me and everything I've learned from him, I see enormous parallels to today's challenges. Brendan, one of those I know that you and I have talked about a few times before is the ability to lead a team into the unknown, into the uncertain. And actually every day for your crew was a step into the unknown, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for, for, for my crew, for those that haven't maybe been familiar with the Clipper race, it's, it's amateur crew. So anyone in the world could sign up to do this round the world yacht race. So like right from the outset, the people who sign up and volunteer and pay the money to go on this adventure, I mean, the setup of the race is that unlike a lot of other extreme activities where if you want to get to the mountaineering, you buy your backpack and boots and you start small and you, you know, you can work your way up in baby steps. This, you can be pretty much a rank amateur with just a couple of weeks training under your belt, get dropped onto one of these powerful racing yachts, go off racing through the Southern Ocean or the North Pacific, which is like uncertainty central, you know, the, the biggest weather, the worst weather anywhere in the world. So, I, the thing I love about them most of them is how much of a step they're taking into uncertainty, into the unknown, just by signing up to do it. And then, as you say, every single day it was about getting up. We don't know what's coming more than about three or four days in advance, meteorologically. Um, the, the race course we've got is, is 2,000 miles wide by 5,000 miles long. We can move within it however we want. So, yeah, creating a team that can just exist in that kind of environment of constant change and uncertainty and, and, and thrive and perform and be safe and feel safe uh, was, was one of the biggest challenges. And actually setting that up was, was something that I didn't anticipate was going to be a huge challenge going into this. I thought it was just a, a, a technical sailing challenge, but actually coming up with that part of the culture was, was one of the biggest challenges and most important things that all the skippers had to do. Yeah. So as a leader, how did you approach that challenge, especially when things got scary? Okay, well, absolutely. I mean, I think for the, the first part, and I, I found a real parallel here with, with how people are managing their teams in that you've got to be authentic and you've got to be yourself and you've got to be real with people. But at the same time, you've got a responsibility to be the, a very steadying influence. And it's not necessarily telling people what they, they want to hear, but understanding that part of your responsibility is, you know, your mood affects their moods so much. And people look to you for guidance, not just in terms of the, the technical day to day, but, but also emotionally in a way. And as a leader of any team, you might not think this, but you have a disproportionate influence over people's moods and attitudes. And however you might be feeling, you've got to in some ways kind of part that and kind of be a, uh, I suppose the best version of yourself and, and, and be that, that positive influence on people. And that can be really difficult because of course we're all working from home now. We've got all sorts of other distractions in, in the home world. And we, that's hard to, not to let that sort of leak in, but uh, yeah, there's a bit of a paradox there between how to be totally authentic with people, but also, you know, make sure that you are that sort of rock at the center of the team that, that can be depended upon not being emotionally volatile, adding more change every day onto the, the, the already large pile of change people are feeling. And Brendan, how do you how do you create that mental toughness? You know, mental toughness is about attitude, approach, and mindset. Obviously, you have a group of people that have never met before. You haven't really met them either, I presume, when they come on. But you have to bond them as a team. So, how do you instill that mental mental toughness in them? That's an interesting one. I think, in some ways, I think mental toughness. You kind of people have what they have, and and. I think a lot of that comes back to, you know, our formative years and childhood and, and the, those experiences we have, but certainly it can be cultivated like, like any muscle. And I think it's easier to do in a team where everyone's aligned and, and wanting the same thing. I think there's something about when we were out there on the sailing yacht, we couldn't, you can't hide from each other. There's, and no one has to feel they've got to project a front or be a certain way with other people. And actually that show of vulnerability allows people to kind of just, be really real with each other and and ask for help and people can quite clearly see when when you need it so i think there was a, a sort of rather than us being sort of all versions of this clint eastwood strong type character just we, we were able to sort of lean on each other and in the same way you know reeds kind of prop each other up we, we were able to do the same so we have this kind of collective mental toughness that 
that was far greater than the sum of its parts, um, d despite you know people having various levels maybe when they, they came into it. But there was something about us all being able to show that vulnerability to each other and you know ask for help. And then at the end of the day, I, I think one of the things I read about, about you, and I, I, I know that to see you, was that no blame environment, that coming at the end of the day and talking about what's happened that day and the emotions and it, how useful and how important is that for any teams? Well, I mean, I would say the no blame culture was one of our biggest competitive advantages, you know, not, not least just because it made it a nice place to, to be, because we're all going to make inevitable mistakes, myself included. And as soon as you can take the, the ego out of the equation, um, uh, people feel they don't need to creatively self justify, they don't need to hide problems, they don't need to hide that they're feeling stressed out or challenged or really struggling this particular day. Um, it just opens up the door to an honest conversation and you know all progress comes on the other side of an honest conversation um, for the leader that I mean that was that was hard on me you know I remember knowing that I had to I it's, it's one thing to write we have a no blame culture right it's you, know, you can put that as one of your values you can put it in the training manual and you know, I work with so many organizations who sort of have that written down somewhere but that is not the lived reality inside um, so the leaders have to show that for real and they've got to live that and so I I had to be okay with standing up in front of my crew and saying, guys, I absolutely got that one wrong. Um, making a show of contrition and apology, really meaning it, taking on board feedback. But you know, I, I did that and the mental film reel I kind of played in my head, you know, it was like everyone sort of whispering and saying, yeah, just like we were saying, you know, person is totally out of his depth and all the rest. But actually that's, that's just that sort of self-sabotaging talk. Actually, it changed the whole conversation. People's sort of body language changed, the shoulders went down, I was like, okay that finger of blame is kind of being taken out of the equation and other people started to talk in that same way as well. And, and that was hugely powerful. Um, I think that was something that we did better than most other teams. We created a space where we could talk about problems that had happened, talk about how we were feeling um, and, and kind of take steps to, to do it and, and have difficult conversations. And it's funny, I think particularly maybe as Brits, we're culturally disinclined from having those difficult conversations. I, I don't know how, how it is, um, in Ireland, Helen, but uh, yeah, being able to do that and sort of create that space for that was was huge for us. And we never let anything sort of get swept under the carpet. That, that's one of the things I remember when you and I delivered a session, it was about a year ago on how you develop resilience. Um, and, uh, you know, I was talking about personal resilience. You were talking about that collective resilience as a crew. How do you become more resilient together? And I mean, I, I describe resilience often as that bounce back ability. And being able to learn from what you've just experienced is critical in, in bouncing back stronger. And you, you were quite vocal about saying we had to learn through this together. We had to become more resilient as a crew. And actually some of the confidence comes from knowing that you've learned the lesson and that you're more equipped next time and knowing that you've learned from that one and that you're getting better. And that, that's kind of a key part of how you become more resilient together, isn't it? Yeah, it was it was a process, and as you as you say, you know, once we'd done it a few times, people sort of became attuned to knowing that whatever happens, we can deal with it. It's not going to get sort of swept aside, and we'll just try and do better next time. We're going to talk about it in a real way, in a no blame way, so it's a constructive conversation. But yeah, we I mean, we learned really early on that we don't. I mean, we don't learn from our experiences themselves. We learn from reflecting on our experiences and. And it, but here's the rub, right? Because when that when that's something that you know we we, we bang our head on something and go, okay, right, well, I'm not going to do that again. And you learn that lesson, but it happens just here. That's one thing. But when it involves a group of 20 people, where things like trust, blameworthiness, competence, you know, all these sort of subtexts can enter the conversation, that's when it becomes a much more difficult dialogue to have. Um, and but but being able to do that. And, and do it crucially in, in that no blame way. And that's not to say accountability kind of goes out the window with it, but um, yeah, to be able to create a space for that was, was huge. And, and like you say, there's, there's often, I think, a, a simplification of the word resilience and people does think it's just that mental fortitude. We think of the sports stars we admire, and you know, other people like that, and they just endure through great suffering and come out the other side. But there's a, you know, when, when it involves a team of people where there's some kind of technical expertise, strategy execution involved, Actually, resilience is more about how you can change course nimbly, how you can learn from mistakes, how you can kind of overcome the, the obstacles in front of you together as 20 people. And just, you know, 20 bulls charging at the gate isn't, isn't going to do that. It's, um, it involves a conversation. One of 
the things, Brendan, when I was thinking of talking to you today, I remember from when I was at Simon's uh, in London at the executive gig, the storm, you showed that visual of the storm hitting the boat at, with huge force one evening. And I remember thinking the fear that they must have felt. And I think we have seen that there's a huge amount of fear around COVID and, and the future and the uncertainty. How did you manage that fear when everybody, you know, needs to be in place and do a certain task to, to get to the end of the race and you could lose it at that point? How do you manage that fear? Well, I think, I mean, in terms of managing it myself, I, I, I had to keep it under very close guard. And I, I, I was just as fearful as anybody else. And in fact, mm. amplified by the fact that, I, you know, I was worried about them, you know, as, as much as myself, you know, and this huge responsibility. Um, but yeah, you know, I really had to sort of swallow that. And, you know, you peel, you peel the way the, the layers of the onion and, you know, you're very fearful inside, but outside you need to, in those moments, kind of project a little bit. And just so people sort of feel that confidence to, to carry on. But at the same time, um, yeah, making people feel safe when perhaps it wasn't the absolute crisis moments, but after something had happened and we're now, I, I feel like we're out of the panic phase of COVID and we're into a sort of slightly more normalizing phase and getting used to this new arrangement, however long it takes. So there's a different kind of uncertainty. And in some ways, the energy of the panic and the change has, has passed. And now it's, it's, it's a bit more of a, you know, a gradual sort of drawn out type change. Um, yeah, this is where sort of just constant communication comes in and an ability to talk about feelings. And this doesn't sit well with everybody, but, but actually to be able to check in with people uh, because we're all carrying this emotional baggage, particularly around how our families are doing with it. The dependence we all have relying on you know all us as sources of income and and safety so it's not just our personal safety you know the knock-on effect is, is much greater and i think you know certainly i do and i'm sure others do have this sort of tendency to catastrophize things so to be able to kind of talk in, a, in an open forum and to get the support of other people you know that that was one of the big things that stopped us from sort of sinking into you know a downward spiral of thought but, yeah uh, in those in those crisis moments, yeah, I, you know, I, I just had to keep my fear under under close guard and sort of try my best to project a, a strong kind of leadership presence. Mm. One of the other real parallels for me here is that um, people think think about being locked down now. You know, you can't go out of your house. You've got to stay in your own home. I mean, you guys were locked inside the hull of a boat for weeks on end. Um, and there are loads of challenges that come with that. I mean, you can't have an argument, slam the door and walk off because you can't walk across the ocean. Um, but equally, you know, like you say, all of the emotion kind of gets kept in the boat. How, how did you as a crew manage that, that dynamic, that human dynamic of making sure you could work together in, a, in that enclosed space for such a long period of time? Yeah, well, we, I mean, we, we identified early on in the pre-race team building sort of uh, meetings and events that we had that, that how we dealt with conflict on board this boat was going to be huge, uh, really, you know, indicative of how successful our campaign would be. And inevitably, there were going to be personality clashes because because uh, on this race, you don't get to choose any of your crew. They, they get assigned to you. So you take any 20 random people and you sort of put them onto this boat, turn the screws of pressure, they've all brought the baggage of their life and their opinions on things um, into it. So, so the scope of conflict was huge. So how we did that was, was really, really big. So in the first instance, we, we encouraged people to just talk openly and honestly. We gave them a little um, script to, to say. And it's funny, I used to practice saying this sort of to myself almost so when one of those situations emerged and, and feelings can run hot, you can sometimes bluster or get lost for words or maybe say something that you don't mean and comes back later. Um, so I'd, I'd sort of rehearse saying this so that when that time came, it was a bit of a muscle memory and it was, look, I can see you and I are seeing this in a really different way right now. Can you just take me on the journey to, to get from where you were to, to why you're feeling this way now? And then I'll do the same. Mm. And I was saying it just like that, almost word for words. I just said it there. And by doing that and practicing saying that when the time came, we could always kind of do that. And it's about empathizing and understanding. And often you find you're in agreement on 90% of things and, and actually the final bit's not hard to work out. Collectively, we also had a, a way of lancing the boil in our daily meetings. So all the crew sat around, we could talk about um, issues that we had with other people in a non-personalized way. So just sort of saying it into the air 
Um, and usually the, the, the culprit, as it were, knew exactly who it was being talked about, but it, it, it allowed, you know, no one lost face, no one felt shunned, and it was a way of it just sort of getting out there. And uh, that worked well for us. I don't think that's necessarily healthy in, in, in every environment, but, but that's what worked for us at Safe. Mm. Actually, I was reading too, just, um, just when you're saying that, that leaders at the moment, and the same for you on that boat, they're being bombarded in a crisis, you're being bombarded with information, now, not just from the media, but emails, meetings, trying to plan and, and think. And that actually the important thing is that you pause. And you pause, you think of it like sprints, your leadership like sprints, and then you pause because you're, you know, it's a marathon. Mm -hmm. And in those moments when you pause, it gives you focus and you're able to focus. Would you have found that or where did you get that solace when you were on the boat? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you couldn't find it physically. You were, you know, 20 people on board a 20 meter sailing yacht. Yeah, there, there was no concept of personal space. But I suppose when you lay down in your bunk, you, you're essentially alone, you know, in your own headspace. Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely would would do that. I found reflective places, you know, and you can you can put the music on and just sort of zone out for a little while if it's safe to do so. Um, but yeah, that, finding that time, and I would say keeping the tank half full is is absolutely crucial because my rationale was that if I ran myself down by trying to be everything and sort of do my job to the best of my ability, which people can equate to just a show of endurance and being that strong person there for everyone without looking after yourself. You let your tank run down and then you don't know when you're going to get hit with a crisis. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you, in, in my case, would have to be awake for over 24 hours dealing with whatever it is. Um, and if you're already you know, run down, there's no way you can perform. So it was a case of, yeah, just doing a little bit of self-care, which on the boat largely meant making sure that you were rested enough, that you were, you, you had, you know, good presence of mind, mental acuity to make good decisions, um, you know, should, should some crisis sort of fall upon you. But here I would say it was the same, same for the leaders to make sure that they step back, they recharge. And in some sense, it's fine to say just escape the house and the family whilst it's lovely being trapped with them. Like, let's just admit that it, it can become claustrophobic with them and then the work and then the, you know, all these demands yeah. not just from the emails and to just kind of go right i'm going leaving the phone here I'm in a responsible not breaking social um, distancing rules just just kind of get out and find some headspace whatever that is mm -hmm. disconnecting yeah. just process the, the 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 other element of this that i think um, lots of people will resonate with you this was a real endurance event from from your point of view you know the, the clipper race is an 11 month race you're at sea for weeks on end and you, you're going to get hit by challenge after challenge after challenge. And you can't just say, I've had enough now. Again, if you're in the middle of the North Pacific, you can't just have enough. I mean, you've got to get to a coast somewhere. Mm. Um, so how did you sort of get back up again, motivate yourself, motivate the crew, and, and kind of be on point day after day when it, it is an endurance event and you, you're getting hit by tough stuff all the time? Yeah, well, I guess it goes back to, to previous points in that I, I couldn't, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone does. And if, if someone was able to say I, I maintained absolute unfaltering enthusiasm for 11 months in the face of it, you'd go, well, I think you're probably fronting there. And maybe there's sports people you've worked with, Simon, who absolutely can do that and I take my hat off to them. But for me, it was the ability to just say to people, guys, I'm, I'm struggling a bit today. You know, I've got something on my mind. I'm, you know, missing home or whatever it is. Um, but just to, to, to kind of be real with people about that stuff and and get their support. And again, we, we all supported one another and, and we were far stronger than, than the sum of our parts. So, yeah, we picked each other up. And, and again, that, that, was, that was one of the large competitive advantages we had and why, why we won the race by such a large margin in the end because you know we we weren't the fastest boat we weren't the you know the highest performing crew but we just did the right things consistently supported each other and we're just always there always pushing and, and all the other boats just fell behind we're hearing you say brendan the control strings have to be loosened yes and i think i remember wondering what you meant by that actually but i think now we kind of understand when people are working remotely and, and teams are that, that's kind of exactly what you meant. You have to trust that people can get on and adapt and, and do things differently once they understand the vision and, and the plan. I, t I get it. And I, I think for, for, for all the control freak 
kind of micromanagers out there, this has been like the worst nightmare. <laughs> it's having to let people get on with things at home. But I'm hoping that at this point, you know, we're a few weeks in now, those control strings just by necessity have had to be relaxed and hopefully some personal growth and, you know, has resulted from that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, you've, you've got to trust people to get on with things. And so long as you set the parameters that you're there to support, um, people can, can call on you if they need, but ultimately you're not there to spoon feed their answers. And, you know, these are the kind of KPIs you need people to work to. You've got to trust that they'll, they'll go on and do that and manage it in, you know, in the appropriate way. Um, and, and, and that's really, really good. And that's, that's absolutely necessary. And, you know, I would contend that the, the role of a leader isn't to be that controlling puppet master. Maybe with the caveat that, you know, when exceptional crisis situations, you've got to jump in and be that directive force. But when times are okay or times are steady, then just taking those small backward steps each day, allowing people the space to stand to their full height, delegating small tasks than, than larger ones as skills and competence sort of dictate, but always understanding that you're minimizing your supervisory presence should be a goal that you've got in some small way. And, and a team that can manage without you is the best kind of team to have. Absolutely. And, it, you know, out of all of the things that you and I've discussed and, you know, I, I found you through reading your book, uh, which uh, if anybody hasn't read Team Spirit, read it. It's a fantastic read. Um, I started to really understand that um, your success came because you enabled the crew to be successful. You enabled that team. And actually, when I look at teams who are overcoming massive challenges, it's usually because the team are strong and the leaders enabled that team to be strong. That's what really carries them through. Brendan, thank you very much. As always, it's an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for joining us. Helen, thank you too. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again on another episode of Pep Talks. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Helen.